So you guys ready to go forward this morning? Sure. Yes. All right. We're going on our sixth week about life in the flesh and redemption of the body. Have you learned anything so far? I hope it was more than that. Yes. <laughs> you've learned something so far? Well, then um, tell me what you've learned. Give me some feedback. What have you learned about the redemption of the body and life in the body? That God cares about the body. God does care about the body, doesn't he? Yes. To what degree? Yeah. He gave the his same. Body. He gave his the same gifts. as what? The same as what? The spirit. The spirit and the soul, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good. What else? We are to be good stewards over that. Yes, we're clearly to be good stewards over the redemptive work of Christ in our body. Amen? What else? That Jesus never did anything that would be contrary to God. That's right. The work that Jesus did, nothing that he did worked contrary to the kingdom. Isn't that right? And what are two things that we remember that he did in his ministry? He healed, he healed us. He healed people. He this part of his body. And he preached the kingdom, right? So in the preaching of the kingdom, as he was preaching the kingdom, he also healed the sick, didn't he? Yes. So like Doris was saying there, his actions were not contrary to the work of the kingdom, right? He's not going to preach one message and then do something else, right? That's something you and I might do, but it's not what Jesus did, right? He preached one message and then he was consistent with it, with what he did, right? He, he healed the sick, he delivered from demonic oppression, and he raised the dead. That is part of life, amen? That's revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the reign of God, right? As opposed to the reign of the enemy, which brings death, yeah. right? Amen. What else? He's enabled us to do the same by giving us his spirit within us. Okay, his spirit has been given within us, amen, right? And so we're able to walk in that life, aren't we, right? Yes. Amen, absolutely. Anything else? Our body is the temple. It is the temple. It's where he has chosen to dwell. Isn't that right? Yes. And I, I don't know. I'm not even going to ask you, but I'm in, I, I would love to know that you guys have begun to think about that, meditate about that throughout the week, because I'm telling you, it is a game changer. When you are, make yourself aware by, by deliberately, on purpose, thinking about the fact that, you know what, I'm not, you know, if, you're in a, if you were in a desert, and people were thousands of miles away from you, you're not alone. Not, not only God is everywhere, but the Holy Spirit is literally in that same body with you. You host the Spirit of the living God on the inside of you. You're never alone. You've never had a moment of being alone since you came to Christ. And now, I mean, and, and there's a certain amount of that that we, we kind of walk kind of aware of, but in such an over-familiar way that we're really not cognizantly aware of it but I'm talking about being deliberate in 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 turning your attention to realizing moment by moment especially decision by decision I host the Spirit of God in this body amen yes thinking about that passionately, passionately. And, and having a passionate um, respect for the one that we're hosting amen I mean, when we're aware of who it is that we're hosting, when we really pay attention to that, you know, uh, it, it does create a desire to be respectful of him. You know what I mean? But, you know, it's not necessarily the thing that's in your mind if you're not being deliberately thinking about it. You know what I mean? Isn't that true? The ball doesn't just automatically roll uphill. It's got to be pushed up with some effort, right? That's the reason the Bible tells us over and over and over again to be diligent. To be diligent. One of the places it says in Peter says, therefore, be all the more diligent to make your calling or your invitation into Christ a sure thing. Make it a sure thing. By your diligence, you need to do something, right? It's a, now, it's not, an initial, it's not an initial work, it's a response. It, he started this whole thing, didn't he? I didn't invite myself, he invited me. But in order for salvation to do me any good, I had to respond, didn't I? Right? I mean, I love him because he first loved me. I responded and came into the kingdom because he first invited me. Right? So, I mean, he does the initial work, but there's got to be a response on my part. And it's that way every day when I wake up in the morning, the Spirit of God is there to enable me to work and to will and to do after his good pleasure. To walk in, to walk in the good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. All that is, 
I mean, I've got all of heaven backing me and the Spirit of God indwelling me. The second I hit the floor, my feet hit the floor in the morning, uh, the Spirit of God is ready to infuse me with all of the power of heaven to honor God that day and the reign of Jesus Christ to be supreme in this life and in this body. But I'm going to have to give that a response. I have to at least acknowledge that he's there. Right? Amen? And the more accustomed we become to acknowledging his presence, the more aware you'll become of it. It doesn't work the other way around. You don't become aware and then acknowledge. You acknowledge and you become aware. Are you following? Yes. I mean, you don't, you don't get fit and then go to the gym. Right? <laughs> doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. You can't read the book without opening the cover. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's going to have to be a response on our part, doesn't there? We have to do something. We have to get some skin in the game. So we have five points all together. Only four I brought up right here because uh, I didn't change the slide. The first one was believe that God cares for and redeemed our bodies. Number two, life in the body is part of the work of the kingdom. Number three, healing is a benefit of the kingdom. And number four, we've been given the Holy Spirit who lives or dwells within, of, within us. Now, remember that I told you that the redemption of the body is part of our great hope. Go ahead and turn to Romans 8 real quick. And we're just going to read verse 22 to uh, 25. That's kind of our key text. For we know, Romans 8, 22 through 25, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Birth pains, meaning something has been conceived on the inside that is ready to give birth. It's, you're in a state of expectation, right? Something's going to happen. The whole universe is aware of it. It says the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only they, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, or rather, the Spirit as the first fruits. Right? The Spirit as the first fruit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Eagerly wait. What are we groaning with? Birth pangs. Something's about to be birthed through us. Right? He says, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. For we were saved in this hope. What hope? Well, the hope that my body is redeemed. Yeah. That hope. We were saved in that hope. You may not have been told that when you got saved, but you were saved in this hope. For a hope that is seen is not hope. For why does someone hope for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not yet see... It puts us in a place of expectation with perseverance. Amen? The Bible tells us that, it says, uh, uh, For you have need of patience, and after you've done the will of God, you will receive the, the promise. For after a little while, he who, say, who, um, who uh, said he will come, will come, and he will not tarry. He says, but um, we do not draw back unto destruction, but we continue believing to the saving of the soul. We are not of those that draw back into destruction, but we continue believing. We continue holding on to hope, expectation towards the salvation of the soul and eventually of the body as well. So, um, the fifth point, which I didn't bring up, uh, and I didn't put a create a slide for it, so I'm sorry, is life in the body begins with an altered perception and tolerance for sin. I'll say it again, though most of you, I thought, read it last week. Life in the body, life in the body begins with an altered perception and tolerance for sin. You don't see sin the same way you did before you got born again. And you've got less of a tolerance for it than you did before you were born again. That is an expression of life in the body. Thank you, Jesus. From the moment you got born again, the internal work of the Spirit giving life to your mortal body started that instant. Yeah. That very instance, right? Life in the body through the Holy Spirit is where we are going today. And in this is revealed what should be our heart response to that redemption of our body. How should we respond to this redemption he's offering? Well, you know, the, the Scripture tells us in no ambiguous terms how we ought to respond, and that's what we're going to look at today, how the Spirit of God is redeeming our body and what our response should be. So are you ready? Yes. Okay, so we've already, um, let's hit a few uh, key points. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1 Corinthians 6 told us. There we go. 1 Corinthians 6. 19 through 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit 
who is in you, whom you have from God, you are not your own. For you were bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Amen? Amen? That is exactly the response that we ought to have. Go to the next one. Jesus' ministry had a focus, as we mentioned a minute ago, on healing. Jesus' ministry had a focus on the body everywhere he went. He preached the kingdom of God, he healed bodies, and he raised some from the dead. We have this testimony, the testimony of Scripture on that. We have this testimony in the Gospels, right? Yes. We know for a fact that that was part of the work of the kingdom, which is the Gospel. And again, I, I don't want us to get lost in terms, because I, I'll use various terms, because the New Testament uses various terms. But the Gospel of the kingdom, or the good news, is talking about redemption, both of the spirit, the soul, and the body, right? But all of that redemption requires a new lordship. We have to enter into another kingdom and be placed underneath the rule of another Lord. Amen? Or you're not going to get any of those things, right? So the gospel of the kingdom, as it is taught, it's taught how the God has paid for a way to reconcile or bring back to God the spirit, the soul, and the body of every man, woman, and child on this planet if they will just believe. Amen? So we have a testimony of this in the gospel. Go ahead and go to the next one. Okay. We also looked at a new word last week, and that was earnest. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, right? Essentially, it means it's the down payment or the, um, the, the preview of things to come. The Holy Spirit is called the earnest of our inheritance in Ephesians chapter 1. Go ahead and go to the next one. In Ephesians chapter 1, I was trying to go through these quickly so that we can get on with the new. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest. Who is? Who is? The Spirit of God who is the earnest of our inheritance until what? Our hope. Until what we are giving birth to is finally given birth to. Right? Till the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Amen? Amen? We have that spirit residing on the inside of us until that time. He stands for part of what is to come, the full redemption of our body. But the good news is that that which, that which we have right now here in our bodies by the Spirit of God is enough to establish the kingdom of God in us. It's enough. The good news of the gospel for this life is that even though you only have a down payment of your inheritance, it's enough to completely establish Jesus' unchallenged rule in your life. Amen. It's enough. Right. We can literally walk out the other end of this life, Jesus being 100% Lord. Being able to say, like Jesus, the rule of this world has been bugging the snot out of me, but he can't find anything in me. Amen. He's been dogging my tail, but he can't find anything. I've surrendered everything to Christ. He, I, I'm, I'm slippery Teflon to him. He tries to grab hold of me and just slides off. He has nothing to grab a hold of. There's no friction. There's nothing to grab a hold of. There's nothing of him in me. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We have that, you realize, we, this is just a third of the Godhead dwelling in us, and it's enough to do that. <laughs> that is. It's crazy. I mean, when you really allow yourself to think about it, we don't even have two-thirds of our inheritance yet, right? We only have the other part of our inheritance, assuming that that's, that's, that's all there is. Not that that's not enough, but, um, you know, all we have is a part. And what we have is enough to completely do above and beyond anything you and I would even have the, the courage to hope or think. Beyond that, Christ in me, absolutely where the image of Jesus Christ is so profoundly established in me that to see me is to see the Father. Thank you, Lord. God. Amazing, right? Yes. That it's enough. That's enough. That's all we need. It's all right here. We don't need anything more. I want you to know that God is not for a partial redemption. The redemption of the whole man was always intended by God. 
Just as right now we only are changed into the character, uh, Jesus' character, to the degree, degree that we see him, right? We don't, I'm not changed into a character of God I don't see yet. I'm changed into the character that I do see, right? As I behold him, I am changed, right? Amen? Eventually, I'm going to see him physically. And this mortal is going to take on immortality. And death is going to be swallowed up by life because I'll behold him as he really is. Amen? Amen. So progressively, step by step, I'm becoming more and more and more and more like him. It has always been his plan to have a full redemption. One day this body will have all corruption stripped from it. All that lends itself to mortality, pain, sickness, decay, and death will be removed from it forever. Oh, but now I have an earnest of that inheritance by his spirit that dwells in me. Remember Romans 8 again. Paul tells us that sin and death still are in our bodies. Isn't that right? Nothing good to, can come from our bodies. However, every one of us has experienced an inner change once we came to Christ, didn't we? Some of us more profound than others, right? Some of us had a, a miraculous response. Some of us had a more casual response. But there was a change, wasn't there? A fundamental change. One of the biggest changes that all of us experienced was as soon as you got born again, there became a love for these Christians that you used to think were just weird. Right? And I'm not saying you changed your mind about them being weird, but now you're one of them. Right? And all of a sudden, you, there's a love for them that wasn't there before. God placed that on the inside of your heart. And we know, the Bible tells us, by this we know that we are born of God because we have love for the brethren. No wonder he makes it such a profound impact on everybody who ever genuinely comes to Christ. When you genuinely come to Christ, there's a love for the brethren that you really can't even explain. It's not a love that's birthed out of familiarity because you don't even really know these people. Right. Not yet. You just got born again. You just come and came in the door, right? But there's this love. There's this uh, affiliation. There's this uh, camaraderie. There's a sense of oneness with these people. Mm -hmm. And you love them. You, don't, you can't explain it. You can't quantify it. You couldn't even write a sentence about it. You just know it's the truth. Mm -hmm. God did that. It's, yes. It's kind of like, um, mm -hmm. I just relate it to, because we were just up there, mm -hmm. going into a new church. Right. You know, you you get the vibe whether you're welcomed mm -hmm. or whether you're not. You yeah. Know? And and other believers, you can immediately fellowship with them that you've never met them, yeah. right? Because you have this in common: Jesus Christ. Jesus. Amen. The Holy Amen. Spirit dwells on the inside of us, and our spirits connect with their spirits, and we know we're one. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. So it's a common ground instantly. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? A wonderful, wonderful experience. So, now, go to the next one if you would. <clears throat> so, point number five. It is hard to control from back there. Life in the body begins with an altered perception and tolerance for sin. Life in the body begins with an altered, percep uh, altered perception and tolerance for sin. It begins with that. The Holy Spirit, when he comes into your heart from the moment you get born again. And we know what happens from the moment we get born again. We saw that with the disciples. And that right how every one of them got born again by Jesus appearing in the room and breathing on them. And he said, receive the Spirit of God. In that moment, they became born again. Isn't that right? Amen. They were changed. That was literally a, a, an outward working out of the dry bones that was spoken of by the prophet. Right? He said, you know, can these, God speaking to the prophet says, can these bones live once more? And he said, only you alone know, Lord. And he said, you as a man, call upon the four winds to blow on these bones that they might live. And so he called on the four winds as a man, by the instruction of God, but as a man commanded the four winds to blow. And they blew on those bones and it says, flesh and sinew came up on the bones and they stood up erect, uh, erect and they were alive. Jesus, as a man, breathed on the dead bones of those uh, disciples. And bones in the scriptures are a symbolism for the spirit of man. A symbolism for the spirit of man. And he breathed on them, and their spirits came alive. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, not as God, but Jesus Christ as a man, by the command of God, breathed on them, and life came as a result. Right? The spirit of God inhabits us from the moment we're born again. Life begins in the body with an alter perception and tolerance for sin. So when we've read before in Romans 8, 11, where it says, If the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, dwell in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. That's what we're talking about here. Life in the body that was given by the Spirit when he came on the inside of us, the second that we were born again, began with an altered perception and tolerance for sin. Once our flesh has lost its grip, <clears throat> I'm sorry, our flesh has lost its grip, and in fact, even our bodies now um, are being trained by his spirit to reject things it once craved. Have you experienced that at all since you've been born again? Oh, yes. Things that your body used to crave, now all of a sudden, doesn't have the power it did before. Some of it's lost its grip entirely. It's not even tempting. Some of it might still be tempting, but not like it was before. You can walk away. You know what I mean? You could fall into it too, but it doesn't have that ownership of you that it used to have. Am I connecting with you guys? Do you know what I mean? Since you've been born again, it be, that began on the inside of your heart, didn't it? Now, as this happens, we are experiencing the life in our mortal bodies that Roman was specifically talking about. So let's go ahead and look at it. Turn to Romans the seven, uh, the um, uh, turn to Romans the seventh chapter, if you would. <clears throat> the key verse that we're looking at in here is in Romans eight, because we're going to read through to Romans eight. But I want you turning to Romans seven. But in Romans eight, verse eleven, it tells us, "But if the Spirit of Him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, does He? Yes. Okay, He dwells in you. Then He uh, the raised that." I'm so dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your immortal bodies or give life to your immortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Now, Romans 7, starting in verse 16. <clears throat> Romans 7, starting in verse 16. These are the verses we're going to be reading through. Romans 7. 16 through 8, 14. We're not in a rush and we don't finish it. We don't finish it. Okay? Romans 7, starting in verse 16. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Stop right there. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. If I do what I will not to do, if I, what I will not to do, that shows a condition um, uh, uh, of, of um, responding to my flesh when it doesn't, no longer has any power over me, right? Romans 6, if we look back at the last chapter, which I don't want to have to do if we don't have to, do you guys remember that in Romans 6, he told us that, uh, that if I die with Christ, then, uh, then I rose with him, and death no longer has dominion over me, right? Mm -hmm. And my flesh does not have dominion over me any, anymore either. He says he did what he did so that the power of sin in the body might be rendered inoperative. It no longer has authority over you. It doesn't say it doesn't speak. Your body is still yakking at you, trying to get you to do all the kinds of things that it still wants to do because death is still resident in the body. Sin is still resident in the body. But it's lost its authority to make you do what it tells you to do. Right? Once you came to Christ, it has no more power. It's been stripped of its authority. You now have another Lord. Amen? And now you live from the inside out. Instead of your body dictating to you, now your spirit dictates to you. Are you following? When you're born again, you live from the inside out. I'm not saying that it can't work the other way. Look at your life. You already know it can work the other way. Your body tells you to do something. You want to do it, don't you? You know, and the reason why it, that relationship was forged over time. Your body has certain desires and you learn to give in to them. And so through habit and through repetitive process, God designed our bodies so that they can be trained. That that's true whether you're born again or not born again. A non-believer can stop sinning. They can train themselves to stop doing acts of sin. They can't stop sinning entirely because of the fact that by doing those actions on their own, they're sinning, right? But they can, they can stop acts of sin. An adulterous man can stop being an adulterous man. A, um, a, you know, a, um, a liar and a cheat can stop lying and cheating, can't they? A person that used to be um, fraudulent in the way they handle money can stop that. Never be born again. Die and go to hell but cleaned up their act. They can do that. Of course they can. 
You can, I mean, the body can be trained. You can be a person, and I know this because I've done it many times. And when by many times, I mean the ball rolled back y'all and I had to push it back up again. But, you know, I, I, I know what it's like to be a person that does not like to, um, to exercise. It doesn't come naturally. It's not something I enjoy naturally. But if I make myself do it, and usually, as you've heard that it said before, it's usually about two and a half weeks it takes to establish a habit. After about two and a half weeks, if I don't do it, even though I'm still not a totally emotionally on board, my body urges me to go do it. My body. The same body that wanted to sit on the freaking couch and not go two and a half weeks ago, now is the one I feel kind of itchy and I feel like the only thing that I feel energy and a need to move. And even though my emotions want to sit on the couch, my body's like, come on. And so, you know, I find myself going out and doing it. You can, you can train your body. Well, you guys are real excited about this, I can tell. You know, um, you can train your body. It yeah, does do, yeah, it, right. I mean, and this, I'm not talking about the Spirit dwelling in you, the Holy Spirit helping you. I'm talking about total demon worshipers can do this because God put it in the body. It's part of our creation. The body can be trained, can't it? It will respond to habitual training. But see, training yourself to stop sinning is sin all by itself, isn't it? Because it's being done separate from Him, right? But... If the, if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your body. And, you know, I've noticed that with things like this, if, uh, when it talks about when it comes to reversing areas of sin uh, or pretendencies of sin in my life, it doesn't take two and a half weeks. It can literally happen in an instant. All it takes is just a surrender and a cry out to the Spirit of God, a willingness to cooperate with the Spirit who now dwells in me, and He gives life to my mortal body. And I can skip the two and a half week training process. I can just go right from this moment to sinlessness. That's power. Are you following? That's life. That's union with God. And, and with the rubber, I mean, it's great for us to talk about union with God and the great by and by and sitting on a, on a cloud stroking a harp, and that's great. Uh, but what's that got to do with right now? You know what I mean? Life in the body is where the rubber meets the road. It's when I am in verse 16. If then I do what I will not to do. Have you ever been this person? you got this desire to go after God and do the right thing, but you find yourself doing the wrong thing again and again and again and again. That's not normal for a Christian. But I can't talk to a Christian yet, never run into one yet, that has not said, that's my experience. That's a shame. It should never happen. Once you're one or two years old in the Lord, that should be something that you only see in your rearview mirror. Are you guys hearing me at all? Yes. And yet it's, that's not the common experience. It's the normal Christian life, but it's the abnormal Christian experience. But I'm not looking to be abnormal Christian. I am looking to be an abnormal human because I don't want to be like them. I want to be other than them, but I want to be just like my Lord. Amen? And it was the common experience for Christ to die once to sin, not again, and then again, and, and then again, and again, and then again, and again, and again, and again. No, he died once to sin for all. And then he lived perpetually to God. That can be my experience, and is, is what is normal for Christianity. The problem is we don't know that, we haven't been taught that, we don't believe that. But it doesn't have to be other ways. Are you following? He says, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that is good. Well, how is he agreeing with the law that it's good? Because even when he does it, he doesn't agree with doing it. Right. Right? right? If I do what I don't want to do, the fact that I don't want to do it means that there's a standard out there that I agree to that I'm not living up to. Right. I'm agreeing that the law is good, right. but my actions, well, not so much. Okay. Right? Yeah. He says, but now, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I, and I didn't <laughs> let go on verse 16 yet. Let's pay attention just for a minute longer. If I... If I do what I will not to do, this is one of the problems that happens in Christendom, is that <clears throat> we become conditioned to fail. We become conditioned to fail. We're Pavlovian dogs, and when we hear the bell, we fail. It's a conditioned response. And, it, and now, the, the bad thing about this is that 
the human soul can't live with verse 16. You cannot live continually knowing what is right and not doing it and still be at peace with yourself. And so you're going to have to do something about it. Either you're going to have to stop doing this or you're going to have to reduce your desires. Are you following? Yes. In other words, either I'm going to have to quit wanting to do it but not do it. I'm going to have to start just doing it. But if I can't do that or if I won't do that, the only other thing I can do is lower the bar of what's right. Because I can't live with it here and not do it. I can't. Human beings, we can't do it. Are you following? There's this inward struggle, this disagreement, and we can't face that moment after moment, day after day. It's defeating, isn't it? Yeah. And so what we have to do is either is soften the blow of it somehow yeah. by becoming less shell-shocked by it. Yeah. It doesn't bother me as much that I don't do what I should do. Oh, Are you following me at all? Does this, yeah. I mean, this isn't foreign to you, is it? No, I've no. experienced this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, and we do that because we can't live with verse 16. That is an unsustainable life right there. And yet you have to realize that is where most Christians live the entirety of their life. And so what do they have to do? They've got to lower the bar because they can't live there. And so what do you wind up having? You have entire groups and philosophies and, and commentaries that are, that are written in communities that gather together that placate one another in their sin. I understand I understand. I'm like that too. Jesus knows what you meant to do. You settle for mediocrity. Yeah, and it's worse than that. We begin to turn it into a theology. That's true. Well, you know that's why we have First John one nine. No, 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 no. When I read that verse, actually, if you go to First John one nine, it says, "If you sin, not when." Hello. Mm -hmm. If. In other words, the way it's worded is, it should be the unusual thing for the Christian. That's right. We've turned that into when. We blow with the bar. Why? Because we can't live with verse 16. That's unsustainable. So, But is there an answer beyond lowering the bar? Yeah! Raise yourself. You don't have to lower the bar. Raise yourself. Well, how do you do that? Well, you can't do it by yourself. We know that. That already failed, didn't it? But I want you to see that the net result of doing this is that our understanding and our view of what the Word of God says, or as this says, the law, I agree with the law that it is good, our understanding of the law is diminished. We change what it says. Well, I can't mean that because I do that all the time and I know I'm born again, so it can't mean that. We reason and we change the meanings of the Word of God. I know you guys have never been that. Yeah. Never been there. Sense of reason yeah. The net result is overall our respect for God, His Word, His ways, and the Spirit drops, and mediocrity becomes the normal Christian experience. That is not what we were invited into. And it becomes a doctrine that we preach by the way we live it. Because God, remember, God said, I don't want you to go out and, and, and testify about me. I want you to go out and be a testimony. And you are every day of your life. You're just a good one or a bad one. But you're a testimony one way or the other. I was talking to a young, uh, young lady that is at the shop where we work um, on Fridays and Saturdays, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And uh, she was talking to me, and I think she has respect for us. Um, it seems pretty clear. But she was talking to me about how a, a shop that she used to work at um, for almost 12, 14 years, whatever. Um, and it was owned by Christians. And she was talking about some of the horrible things these people did regularly and, and how, um, how worldly they were. Uh, and she gave an example of, of, uh, that was just astounding to me. Uh, um, uh, uh, one of the ladies who owned the, co-owned the shop with others, a family venture, her father had gone up on a ladder and evidently fallen down and um, uh, when this girl I was talking to had gone out of the shop, um, there was a pool of blood on, on the ground, and he was just kind of sitting there, standing there dazed, not knowing what's going on because it was a head injury. 
And uh, um, and so she called the owner of the shop to let her know, and she's like, well, make sure you clean that blood up. I don't want to stay staining the floor. Didn't even ask how her father-in-law was doing. This is someone who claimed to be a Christian. Their concern was more about the bottom line than about customers and how it might run people off than it was about the health of the man. First words out of her mouth. You know, and, and you know, she was a testimony. She was a testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ right there. How ineffective it is. How it doesn't change anybody. It's just placating words. It's just words. Yeah? I mean, yeah, I know. We, we've been made to sit with them in heavenly places, but you know where I really sit is in the gutter. Yeah, I, I know, I know. It says that, you know, that, uh, that he who, uh, um, whoever uh, says, uh, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord overcomes the world. But, you know, that doesn't mean I have to give up this, 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 and this. I mean, it just means I need to change a few things and, you know, try my best and, and make sure I always say 1 John 1, 9. Now, people may not say those words, but they're living that. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. If was the word, right? Not when. If. So there's going to have to be a fundamental change. Wouldn't you agree with me? Because it, verse 16, again, is unsustainable. You cannot live there. Something's going to change. Either our standard is going to change or we're going to change. But something's going to change. And if our standard changed, the game is over with. Because it requires, it requires us to lower the meanings of what Scripture says. And I see it all the time. <clears throat> I talk literally in one month, hours at a time, with people on, on, the, uh, on the Internet about these very issues right here that, that, that blanket their sin under the grace of God. I'm like, well, no, no, no. My Bible says the grace of God has appeared, has appeared to all men, teaching them to deny ungodliness. Amen. The grace of God does not cover ungodliness. Nowhere in the Scripture, you will not find a place in the Bible where it says the grace of God covers our ungodliness or compensates for it. No, it changes it. It teaches us that we're to deny ungodliness. Hello? That's what grace does. Grace is not some power that just forgives your sins. Grace comes in and changes me so I don't sin. <laughs> That's the true grace of God. That's the good news. That's the influence of God. I mean, really, if we think about it, if you really understand redemption on a relational way like the man earlier revealed it, God, who is a holy God who's got a character that cannot change, who wants to have genuine, not fake, real intimacy and fellowship with you, he can't commune with someone who is completely foreign to him. There's no common ground. So he's not going to come to you and influence you to just continue to live in your sin but just feel good about it. Because it's not going to meet the end pro purpose of salvation. The end purpose of salvation was not to just be accepted by God but not be intimate with him. Right? The whole point was to be able to have an exchange and intimacy with him, to have co-partnership with him in the work of the kingdom of God. I can't do that if I'm different than him. Right? Mm -hmm. And so his influence is to influence my heart to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Right? Mm -hmm. He quickens me and enables me to do what I can't do. Mm -hmm. I can't deny that stuff. And even if I can, it's still just me doing it. I'm still miles away from God. So what God wants is still not being done. I'm still in sin. Yes? I was just connecting to Wednesday night in my mind about, um, you know, us aligning ourselves to Him. Yes. Because, and and when, you, when you look at the, the lowering of the standard isn't just lowering of a standard. It's basically lowering who God is. That's right. Because He's the standard. Yeah. We've changed God, and that's exactly what I quoted on Wednesday from Michael Card. We've made God in our image, and so our faith is idolatry. Yeah. We lower God. Because yeah. we can't stand the standard to stay like it is. Not in live verse 16. We can't do it, right? Yeah. But now, verse 17, but now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will, to want to do what is right, is present with me. But how to do it, that I don't find. You guys connect with that? Mm -hmm. He says to want to do the right thing is very present with me. I'm very aware I want to do it. But how to do it, I don't find. For the good that I want to do, that I don't do. But the evil that I don't want to do is what I find myself practicing. Not just doing, practicing. 
That's turning an if into a when, right? Are you guys still tracking with me on that? Yeah. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Now, a lot of Christians stop right there, and they just placate their soul with that awareness. Well, then, then I really, I'm absolved from all responsibility, because it's really not me doing it. It's just a sin of my flesh. Oh, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. He didn't, he, he, the, 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 his letter didn't stop there. <laughs> Keep reading, right? He begins to give us hope for overcoming sin in the body. Right? He doesn't just leave us there. He says, <clears throat> Now if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law. We're not talking about the law of God. We're just talking about a rule. I find a, a procedure, something that's commonly followed. Right? I find a law that evil is present with me, the one that wants to do good. Well, I found that law too. Did you find that law? Yes. I got born again at five, and I found that out very quickly. That, you know, as, as even though I wanted to do good, evil was still present with me. I didn't even have to read this. I could have broke that. Yeah. Couldn't you have? Yeah. I, I didn't need someone to tell me. When I got born again and I wanted to do what was right, I knew instantly evil was still with me. Mm -hmm. It was plaguing me to go back and do the things I used to do, mm -hmm. right? Think the way I used to think. Evil was present with me. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Now, the inward man is not talking about your spirit. It's talking about your soul. You don't desire anything in your spirit. You desire it in your soul. Your, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Another word for will is desire. Where do I desire things? Do I desire things in my kidney? No, I desire things in my will, right? It's in my soul, correct? And in fact, we'll see that very clearly. Let's look at verse 22 and 23 together. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of God in my mind. Mind. So he's, click, he's, he's linking the inward man with the mind. Are you following? He says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but there's another law in my body, and it wars against that law that I just talked about that's in my mind. And it brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my body. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with my mind I myself serve the law of God, but my flesh is still serving the law of sin. I'm still in verse 16. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, he's, now pay attention to this. The reason why that law of sin and death is in my body I've been made free from it is because of the law of the spirit of life. Let's look that up. Let's find out what is the law of the spirit of life. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to know more about this life if it's setting me free from the, li the, the law of sin and death in my body. How about you? I want to know about this. Well, 1 Peter chapter 3. Starting in verse, or it may just be, just verse 18, I can't remember. It says, For Christ also suffered once for us, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but having been made alive in the Spirit. Made alive, where? In the Spirit. So when he talks, so we have three laws here. The law of my mind that desires to do what's right. The law of my body that desires to do what's wrong, and a law of spirit. Of, of, um, I'm sorry, and a law of. Um, oh, I lost my place. I'm sorry. Uh, of the spirit of life that's in my spirit. Are you following? Mark, I'm sorry. Yes. What, what, where are you at? First Peter three eighteen. Eighteen. First Peter three eighteen. For Christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. Right? Yes? Yes. Okay. So here we have, uh, let's go ahead and look at another passage. Look, turn to Ephesians, the second chapter. This is even more clear. Ephesians, the second chapter. We're just going to read the chapter. Ephesians chapter 2. And you he made alive, 
who were dead in trespasses and sins. What part of me is he talking about? Well, no, 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 he's not. No, no, he's talking about my spirit. My soul is progressively coming to life, but it wasn't made alive all at once, was it? I still have rebellion towards God, which means there's death still in my soul, isn't there? And there's definitely death in my body. Right? Sin and death are both alive in the body. Active in the body, I should say. But what was made alive? What was made like God? What was made union, in union with God? My spirit. The Bible doesn't say we were made one soul or one flesh with Him. We will be, but we're not yet. The only thing that says that we've been made one with is the spirit. It says God, that we are one spirit with Him. Right? Nowhere in the Bible does it say we're one soul with Him. No one in the Bible doesn't say we're one flesh with him. Now that is coming. That's part of my hope, isn't it? Yes. But my soul is still being saved. My spirit is the only thing that's completely saved, right? That's the who I am that Paul was talking about. And you he made alive who were once dead in trespasses and sins. And once you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. They don't just, they're not just dead, they have a spirit that works in them, right? They are possessed by the spirit of the devil. You and I have been possessed by another spirit, amen, and sealed. The door was shut and locked and bolted and nobody else gets in there, amen? We've been sealed with the precious Holy Spirit of God, amen? Among whom also we once conducted ourselves. In the lust of our what? Flesh. Flesh. Now you could still do that, couldn't you? Yes. You have done that, haven't you? Yes. Since being born again, we all have, right? Yes. But he says here, among whom you once conducted yourself. In other words, you ordered the whole course of your life. Well, that ended when I came to Christ. I have visited the lust of my flesh many times since I've come to Christ. But the ordering of my life has never been back there again. Are you following? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. He says among whom we also conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Pay attention to what he's saying here. You did what you wanted to do because your body influenced your mind to do it. Right? Yep. You were fallen by nature. And all of that agreed with who you were spiritually. You were dead spiritually. You were one with the father of lies. Right? And so you did the desires of your father. Now what Jesus said, he says, you were of your father the devil when he was talking to the Pharisees, and the desires of your father you want to do. Right? Well, that's essentially the same thing he's saying here. That spirit that was at work in the sons of disobedience, which I used to be one of, among all whom also you once conducted yourself in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by very nature children of God's wrath, just as others. But God who is rich in mercy, amen, who is rich in tender loving kindness, aren't you glad? Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, by his influence, amen, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace through his acts of kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That's your future. God did this, so then the, the word ages means eons. The unspeakable distances of time that is our future. The eternity that we face. That we might exist in a state where God is constantly being kind to us. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, you understand, this is part of what it means to be brought up into the character, character, um, uh, perichoresis. Because that's what the Father always does with the Spirit and the Son. They're always looking to be kind to Him. The Father loves the Son. The Father loves the Spirit and spends Himself on them lavishly. Nothing would He hold back. He is kind to them, epically kind. And, and Jesus is the same with the Father. The Father so loved the world that the Son allowed himself to be given. He spent himself and was kind to the Father by being, by becoming the purchase price to bring back to the Father what the Father desired. Creation was the Father's desire, the Bible says. 
It wasn't, in, it wasn't the desire of Jesus on his own or of the Spirit on his own. It was something that was conceptualized in the mind of the Father. It immediately became the desire of the Son and the Spirit because the Father wanted it. No one, so, no one, see, all of it begins to make sense. Everything begins to make sense when you understand how it works. If the Father wants it, who's going to make it happen? The Son and the Spirit. Who was it that was the architect of this universe? Jesus was. Who was he building it for? The Father. Who empowered Jesus to do his work? The Spirit. Why? Because the Father wanted it. Now, so when the Father lost his dream by man rebelling, who came to the rescue? The Son and the Spirit. Because they're eternally kind to him. They spend themselves on him. There are no limits. I will forever become a human and live in a human body forever in the limits of that body because I love you and I'll spend myself on you lavishly again and again and again, Papa, because I love you. And the Father loved them enough to allow them to do it. Yes, amen. This is lavish love that you and I haven't even begun to conceptualize yet. And we're being brought into it. He's saying, come here, Pam. I'm going to be kind to you forever. You're like, Papa, I'm going to be kind to you forever too. <laughs> you know? And Jesus, oh, I love you so much. I'm going to be kind to you forever. I know you love me, daughter. I know you do. We're going to spend an eternity together. Oh, Spirit, you saw me through so much. I wouldn't be here if you hadn't spent yourself on me. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to spend an eternity being kind to you. I adore you. I know you do, Pam. I know you do, and I love you too. And eternity begins. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what we've been invited into. For an eternity, he spends himself on us, and we spend ourselves on him. Amen? Yes. But we don't have to wait till then, because I'm in eternity now. I can spend myself lavishly now. And one of the best ways we do it, one of the best ways that God is glorified is by the power of the Spirit. Working, see, I'm cooperative. What have I done? I've entered into the perichoresis, and now I, together with the Son and the Spirit, are living to be kind to Papa, fulfilling his desire and his dream. Amen. And so the kingdom work on the inside of me, I'm cooperating, I'm locked on with the Holy Spirit, and we together please the Father. And the way that we do that is becoming like the Son. Amen? Amen. And that requires me to, by the power of the Spirit, put to death the sins of the flesh. Because the sins of the flesh are contrary to the Father. I can't, I can't fulfill his dream of being close to him by living foreign to his character. There comes a way in which I can't get close. I can't commune. We have no common ground. So I refuse the things that are not of common ground and embrace the things that are of God. Who I'm already like on the inside. Amen? Amen. Because he's made me like him spiritually. Amen? Amen. He says, um, verse 2, for, uh, verse 1 again. There is therefore no, now co no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because... The law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, where is that law? It's in my body, isn't it? Yes? But I'm free from that law. It's no longer a law to me. Are you following? Yes. Now, it might suggest some things to me. It might try to influence some things to me. But it's not a law. Because I'm not of that kingdom anymore. Amen? And it has no rights over me. It's lost its grip. For what the law could not do and that was weak through my body, God did. Thank you, God. Amen. Isn't he kind? Yes. He is so kind. Right? For what the law couldn't do and that was weak through my flesh. The law, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law of God is a good law because it's based on his character. Nothing contrary to God is in his law. Regardless of what... Modern theology might tell you there's nothing foreign to God's character in his law. Nothing. He's the one that wrote it. Right? Yes. Now, I understand he didn't carve it with his finger. He did that with the ten. 
but all the others came out of the ten, and God inspired that they be recorded for us, right? Yes. The whole New Testament is Paul quoting the Old Testament. The whole New Testament is. There's a, you can barely link seven words together in the New Testament that do not in some way connect to the Old. It's almost impossible to find. And people somehow are oblivious to that fact. And yet it's all the way through the New Testament. It is his character. Amen? There's nothing wrong with the law. It was never broken. Remember, what did Paul say? The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. What? What did he say? Call the law? The law was spiritual. He says the law is holy, righteous, and good. I don't hear anything in there that's contrary to God. Do you? So it's all good, isn't it? But it, so the law wasn't broken, I was. He says, for what the law could not do, not because it was weak, I was. God did that by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh without condemning the flesh. Right? Yes. God didn't condemn my body, he redeemed my body. But he condemned the sin in the body, didn't he? Yes. And Jesus died that death. So that the righteous requirement <laughs> of the law might be. Everybody say might be. Might be. Now, what's the difference between might be and will be? It's a could be, isn't it? That's right. Well said. It's not, in other words, it's not a definite thing. Is it? It says it might be. Well, well, well what's going to be the determining factor of whether it is or isn't? Well, he tells us. Let's keep reading. He says, might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to their flesh, but according to the Spirit. I'm in, I'm in Romans 8, verse 4. That's okay. Let me read 3 and 4 together as one thought again. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Right? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in me if, if, I do not walk according to the dictates of the flesh, but according to the dictates of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I don't, there's a problem. Skip on down. We're going to get there eventually, but just go ahead and skip on down, and we'll see what winds up happening. Verse 12 and 13. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you do that, you will die. die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. live. Who's he talking to? Brethren. Us. Isn't he? Yes. So back up here with might be, right? Might be. That requires me to do something, doesn't it? Not to initiate something, but to respond to something. God didn't ask you to initiate anything. He's just asking you to respond, right? Yes. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in me, who do not walk into the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Let's look at that real quickly. I want us to really pay attention to it. If I live a certain way, if the, if the word live means order the course of my life is essentially what it means. If I order my course of life according to the flesh, it's because I think fleshly. This is pretty simple, isn't it? And, other, and if, I live, if I set my mind on spiritual things, it will set my course aright for living spiritually as well. How I live is a reflection of what I'm thinking about. Isn't that true? I mean, again, this isn't rocket science. Anybody could have told you that, right? This didn't require the Bible to write it. Any, anybody out there, any philosopher, any counselor, any parent knows, any human knows that you walk after what you're thinking about. Well, well, you know, the one thing, the universal that they tell people that say, I will not be like my parent. I just laugh at them and walk away. You are about to be a carbon copy. Oh, no, 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 no. No, they were fastidious about this, and I'm the complete opposite. The core of what made them that is the same thing that's making you what you are. You are exactly like them. And the reason why is because you focused on them the whole time. That's right. Right? Yes. It's the truth. You become like what you pay attention to. It's the highest form of praise is emulation. Oh, I don't want to praise my parents. <laughs> they were mean people. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're giving them the highest form of praise by the what you're doing. You're living just like them. 
by determining that you won't, you're just like them. It's the truth. None of us can escape it. Well, you know, the saying is true concerning how we walk spiritually. If we walk according to the flesh, there's a reason for that. It's where, you, you, it's where your mind lives. If you live spiritually, there's a reason for that. <laughs> it's, where your, it's where your mind lives, right? Go ahead and turn real quickly to Galatians, the fifth chapter. We'll probably have to end there. Galatians, the fifth chapter. Don't lose it in the home stretch. Stick with me, guys. Galatians, the fifth chapter. This isn't new. It's written all the way through the Bible. Galatians, the fifth chapter, <clears throat> verse 13. For you, brethren, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for your flesh. That's what Paul would say, speaking to many people in the hyper-grace movement. He says, yeah, 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 you're free. That's right. That's true. True enough. But don't use your liberty as an opportunity to live according to your flesh, because then you're not free anymore. Right? He says, liberty as an opportunity to flesh, but through love serve one another. For all of the law is fulfilled. Well, why do I care if I fulfill the law? I thought I'm free from it. Well, obviously it must be important or he wouldn't have written it here. Right? Mm -hmm. He says, all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You'll find yourself doing everything it wrote if you just do that. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's essentially what we just read in Romans, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you live according to the flesh, it's because that's where you think. If, if you live according to the Spirit, it's because that's where you think. Well, what does it mean to think spiritually? What does it mean to think carnally? I mean, if, if, it, if it's telling me that the, the cure that Paul was talking about of, I want to do this, but I find myself doing that, how do I fix this? He just told us. Put your mind on things spiritual. Well, what do you mean? What spiritual stuff do I need to have my mind on? Galatians tells us. He says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are two, these two are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Doesn't it sound just like what Romans 7 said? Mm -hmm. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Meaning, in other words, it's no longer your dictator and your tutor, right? Because you've already been brought to Christ. It doesn't mean the law is irrelevant. It means it's no longer your taskmaster, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the works of the flesh are this. So if I want to know what kernel is, I read this list. This is the stuff that if I set my mind on it, I'll walk this way. He says the works of the flesh are evident. They're obvious. And this is what they are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies. He's not letting me go on sorcery. Sorcery, by the way, sorcery is manipulation. Trying to get people to do what you want them to do. Trying to control other people's will by your influence. That's sorcery. It's rampant in the body of Christ. Rampant. In the body of Christ. Sorcery. Why he had me say that, I don't know. But um, let's back up to verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, manipulation, in other words, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I told you, tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who habitually practice these things will not, say will not, no. will not inherit the kingdom of God. They're kidding themselves. They won't. There are Christians out there that are deceiving themselves, thinking that they will end inheriting the kingdom of God while they live pursuing the flesh. And he said, I'm telling you, that ain't going to happen. You're deceiving yourself. If you do not put to death the deeds of the body, you will die. It's pretty clear. I mean, I'm not, have, I'm not writing anything new. It's all written right there, isn't it? It's very clear. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. So if I want to set my mind on spiritual things, this is where I plant my head. Right? 
love, joy, peace, <coughs> long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Right? So if I want to know how to do what he tells me here in Romans the 8th chapter, that's it right there. If you walk according to the flesh, then your mind is focused on stuff that is in verse 19 through 21. Right? Yes. If I'm walking according to the Spirit, I'm focused on things that are written in verse 12 and 20, I'm sorry, 22 and 23. Right. It's that simple. This isn't rocket science. This is obvious. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why that pretty much that exact same list is what Paul brings up in Philippians 4. When he says, don't be anxious for anything, right? But in prayer and supplication, make a request for me, and then God goes on down, and he says, and now, my brethren, think on these things. What's in the list? Very much the same things that are in this list. What's he trying to do, get you to do? Walk habitually after the Spirit by thinking about the things of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. This is very simple, isn't it? This isn't hard. Now, now I'm going to have to end because of time. But I want you to, to consider the fact that so far, what he's offering us, life in the body, according to this passage, as we continue to read in Romans 8, I'm not saying life in the body cannot be manifested by healing the body. We already know that, don't we? That's an absolute truth. Jesus didn't do what he did, did not do what he did by himself. The Holy Spirit empowered him to do it, didn't he? So when Jesus preached the kingdom of God, the good news of the reign of God, a result of that, uh, a, a, an expression of life in the body, was the Spirit of God healed bodies, raised them from the dead. Yes. So I'm not stealing from that. I just want you to know that in context, Romans 8 is talking about life in the body is expressed by dying to sin, giving up sin, conquering sin, living godly. He infuses life into our mortal bodies, right? Now, I'll, I'll quote one scripture and we'll end there, okay? In Hebrews, and we'll bring it up next week. But in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, it set, tells us that, that baby Christians only desire milk. They can't handle strong meat. But strong meat belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use of the Word of God, putting it into practice, have trained their senses to discern between what is right and what is evil. The meaning there doesn't just mean to distinguish between the two, but to choose the good above the evil. You realize your body can be trained to the point where it rejects sin? Yeah, that's life in the body. I have things that I used to feel fine with. And, and really, maybe at that particular point in my life, it wasn't wrong because I didn't know it was wrong. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it, regardless of whether it was or wasn't to me, at the time, I might do things or think things that I really didn't pay much attention to, that now I find offensive. And I, 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 would, I find it very... Uh, have, you, have you ever had an experience where something, uh, things that you used to do or things that you used to think or, or ways that you used to act, now when that thought comes to you, you kind of find it repulsive? Mm -hmm. It's almost like if you ever try to take what it feels like to me here is a lot like it when you're trying to put um, a, a two like, um, a, a like sides of a magnet together. Two positive ends, they repel, don't they? That's how I feel with that. Something in me, even my body kind of uh, repels against it. That's life in the body. He's infused life. Even in my body. Even in a body that has death in it, it's still going to die. It's still mortal. I can still get life in that body so that the body, even itself, even its senses, begin to reject sin. God. That's how we can live the normal Christian life. Not the normal Christian experience. Are you with me? Are you guys excited about going forward with this? Yes. yes. Okay. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the fact that your freedom that you've given us is not a superficial freedom. It's not... A freedom in word only and proposition only. It's a real freedom. But we literally can walk free of the people that we used to be and walk in agreement with our new nature that you've given us. 
Lord, I thank you. I know that we still have sin and death resident in the body. Paul makes that very clear. Then we got a soul that's fickle. So one day it likes the flesh and one day it likes the spirit. But Lord, you are able. You are able, more than able by the spirit that dwells in us to cause us to will and do after your good pleasure. That's the redemption of the soul. And you're able to infuse life into our body so that even our body discerns between and chooses the good above the evil. This is a powerful salvation. It's far beyond what we could have ever done because you said the law wasn't a problem. It was weak through our flesh. Our flesh couldn't do it. But through you, we can do all things. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Magnify yourself. Glorify yourself through us. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen.